I would love to hear Lisa Atkin about their journey, about their work. In today's interview, Lisa Atkins will talk about one, what her mother did to prevent her from passing her own fears to her children. Two, how her daughter supported her when she first wanted to write her book. Three, how the work she does with 10 Women Strong is helping women to beat their internal critic. Four, the cost of in-person work and the remote tools that she, Lisa, uses to avoid these costs. And five, the future that she sees for Agilists. I'm Yves Hanul from Who's Agile. My pronouns are he and him. Welcome to my channel. You see a lot of Agilists around me on this screen. If you want to hear me interviewing, please click that subscribe button because these are the people that I've invited so far. If you think I'm missing people, let me know in the comments. And that like button, well, if you liked today's interview, don't forget to click it. Hey. Hi, Lisa. Good How evening. Are How are you uh, doing? I'm doing fine. I said good evening, but it's actually evening for me. What time is it on your side? It is still the morning on my side, almost noon. So we're coming up to lunchtime in a little while. So that's that's one of the things interesting about doing this and living in these times is that, yeah, we can connect both from our time zones out. And so it's, uh, it's great. Yeah. yeah, we're lucky. We're lucky we have technology. Exactly. I would not want to have a, yeah, a COVID situation without technology, all being stuck at home, without being able to talk to the rest of the world or to just to our family. Yeah. You know, this is sort of um, our substitute, you and me. This is our substitute for our once yearly conversation that we used to have at a personal, you know, in-person conference. Do you remember that? We exactly. Used to, we used to sit down in some chairs the two of us and we would just chat about whatever was on our minds whatever was going on with coaching whatever we were inventing you know i remember one time we were on a boat i think it was is it in chicago i, I think remember. it was in chicago wow and i remember, remember a conversation yes. with the two of us and so this is our substitute for that <laughs> exactly and we we share it with the rest of the world like That's probably right. in some conferences there were people around us listening in and and jumping in from time to time Okay. Uh, well, before we jump into that, Lisa, um, let's introduce yourself a little bit. What do you want the people to know about you? I think the most important thing for people to know about me is that I am um, still and probably will always be an intrepid explorer and learner. And I think that that is one of the things I love the most about the Agile community is that we're constantly learning and sharing with each other. And um, in terms of the work I do in the world, there's really two streams of it. There's supporting the ever um, uh, increasing discipline of agile coaching, which I am still doing through um, some new things that I'm recording called guided study and practice groups around the coaching agile teams book, which 10 years later, 11 years later, is actually still going really strong. And so if it's work in the That's world, the book you're not, talking about. Huh? Oh, there you go. Yeah. So if, so if it's work in the world is not done, then I'm not done. That's how I view that. And then the other book mm -hmm. you have there is Lead Together, which is a book I didn't write, um, but I love the content so much. And I knew one of the authors and we got to talking just, you know, a friend to friend chat kind of thing. And before I knew it, I said, I would love to be the voice of your of your audio book. And so I'm the voice of Lead Together. <laughs> oh, OK, that's 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 wonderful, because indeed I read the book and I listened it uh, recently to the, the Coaching Agile Teams book uh, in a sense again. And that was my rediscovering. And indeed, I loved I, I think I told you already but I really loved the way you you read it out. Uh, and I was again surprised. I told it recently to someone as well. I was surprised about how much depth that there is in that book that i read 10 years ago and that yeah i probably didn't gasp everything at, at the first time that i, yeah, well, that I read it me either honestly even as the author i'm finding new depths in what is seemingly simple things i mean i think that's the beauty of things that have a lineage and they have a um they have an intention is that you can continue discovering and then lead together is awesome because so many people want to know, you know, how do I lead in the 21st century? And and this is like leaders everywhere in organizations, just not just at the top. Um, and we and we want to embrace these new values. We want to embrace the things that people would talk about as teal organizations or 21st century management or leadership. 
but yet we don't often have the scaffolding or the practices to do it. And so that book is chock full of like super practical stuff that I loved um, getting to articulate in my own voice. That's that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, it's it's one of the books that's on my stack to to read or to listen to. Now now it will be on my to listen to because then it's uh, it's becoming even better uh, because yeah. that's that's yeah. some of the things on how to, yeah. to do it. So those well, are the things that I'm doing in agile coaching. That's the one mm -hmm. of the two streams in my own um, private practice as a solopreneur that and I collaborate with a lot of different people necessarily and for yeah. my own benefit. Um, I'm working with leadership teams and I'm helping them become more high performing sort of in the way they ask delivery teams to be. Um, and of course, they have to encounter their own issues and patterns and things in order to do that. And um, and, you know, we're all being asked to really shift the way we lead in the world right now. And it's a shift to something that is unfamiliar and scary for most people. So I really enjoy accompanying people through that change. I can I can imagine it's uh, yeah it's it's both confronting and uh, confronting I mean and at the same time helping people um, it's uh, why would I say it yeah it's 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 nice to see people grow and so when you can help them it's 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 it, it usually helps us as well eh? in a sense yeah, that we're working with people there's nothing better there is nothing better than when you know, someone gets what they wanted. They get to have the impact they wanted to have. And usually, not always, but I would say the vast majority of the time, they get it with a lot more ease than they thought was possible. And they get it with a lot more flow than they ever imagined existed. So, you know, all of this is really settling us down into the aspiration that Agile has been creating for us for a long time. You know, with these, no these notions of transparency, flow, collaboration, and basically, like my new mantra is, easy is right. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, well, yeah, I, I, it reminds me of a few conversations that I had recently about easy, simple, all, all these kind of things. It's, um, and sometimes we don't realize how, how it's going to be. And then we make up all these monsters in our head that yeah. actually make it much worse than it actually is in reality. Oh, we do. We are our own limiting factors. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's a, that's a great way of putting it. Okay, let's jump right into my first question. What is something that people usually don't know about you but has influenced you and in, in who you are? You know, this is probably not the most profound thing, but since it's so present, um, I've just come from swimming and I'm still like a little bit um, sweating from that. And um, and. It's a, it's a long story, my relationship with swimming and with water. When I was a little girl, my mother would say, do you see that little girl on the bottom of the pool? That's my little girl. And I would have this long, long, long hair that went down to my waist. My hair would be streaming out behind me. So I actually thought I was a mermaid when I was a child. And, wow. I, actually, and I actually do think I am a mermaid, truthfully. I mean, if we get right down to it. So, but the way that that showed up later is that I was a horrible swim team. I mean, really, really bad, but my brother was really good at it. And he's four years younger than me. And he would not go unless I went. And so I remember one year they were giving out these awards at the end of the swim team season. And, and they gave me the Iron Maiden Award. And then the joke was they would have to, you know, put me in irons and, and drag me to the pool to make me swim. But I did it for my brother. And so um, years later, he and I are both swimmers. That's that's our main form of um, relaxation and exercise. And so something about that stuck. And what I think is most amazing about that is that my mother is deathly afraid of water. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is that why she wanted you to swim? Is it because she, she was afraid? Absolutely. She put us in swim lessons as early as possible. And um, I remember when my brother was small, she had the, the huge orange life vest on him because she mm -hmm. knew that he she couldn't jump into the water to save him if he was drowning. Ah, because she, she couldn't but swim. She couldn't swim. She would only get she would sit on the edge of the pool and put her legs in, and that was it. That was it. Wow. One time at a party, someone thought it would be really cute to try to throw her into the deep end. He did not fare so well because her survival instinct kicked in. And I think it's the only time that she has really like come out with like the claws and the and like, you know, she was not messing around. That guy was not putting her in the pool and, and he did not. 
<laughs> because well, but I yeah, if you're afraid of walrus, I can yeah. imagine that this is terrifying, is right? And so as a result, you know, I, I love that she overcame her limitation and gave both of her children a love of water. Because both of us truly love water. We have a, a sailboat on a lake about two and a half hours from here. And it is my happiest place is to be on that boat, lost in some cove somewhere and just be on the water. Yeah, because I, I um, yeah, what I want to say is that it's really good that that she could, well, she could have um, given her fear back to to both of you, but she she worked hard in a sense to to do the opposite. Yeah, uh, she did. I mean, I really appreciate her, and I'm just so aware of her courage and her tenacity to be able to do that. And and on, I can imagine that on top of well the 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 practicality of of being the water, it's it's also something else that she taught you that okay, even if you're afraid of it, you don't have to pass it on to someone else. Yeah, which yeah. as a coach, I think is is even more important. You know, that's think. that's really good. That's you're right. That's really good. Now I'm thinking, what have I passed on? What fears have I passed on to my daughter, or what fears have I not passed on to my daughter? Hmm, I'll, have mm -hmm. to, I'll have to ask her. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we, we don't have time to go into that, but uh, maybe that's for the next time that we meet. Uh, then we can we can talk about it. I'm really interested then to to learn about that. Yeah, me so too. So we <laughs> we can learn at that moment. Okay, let's go to that next question. That if you would not have been into IT, what would have become of you? Because I know you were originally uh, a project manager, if mm -hmm. I remember, before you mm -hmm. became an agile coach and everything. Um, so is there anything else that you think you could have become or that you were destined to become? I don't know. You know, I um, I had a lot of interest. Actually, I was just telling someone this yesterday that I know a lot about sharks, believe it or not, because when I was in high school, I had a really great biology teacher. And I mm -hmm. got so interested in biology and especially marine biology and especially sharks. I think they are so amazing. And so I did a lot of studying about sharks and I for sure wanted to go to school to be a marine biologist. And the story of my family is that we are a blue collar family and um, my brother and I are the first to go to college. And so uh, there was a lot of limits placed on me about what I can study in college. And basically- Because that, you had to succeed in the Exactly, sense. exactly, exactly. And you know, my parents, you know, it's so interesting I'm talking so much about all the gifts they gave us. They gave mm -hmm. both of us as, ch as children and growing up. You know, like they scraped together every single semester to make our tuition payments and all that. And they did an amazing job making sure that we got really good educations. Um, but it was really clear to me that in order to make them proud, I would have to do something that made good money. And so I, the, my, my world got narrowed really early because of that. And I, I don't regret it at all. It's just part of the story that happened. Um, and honestly, I'm not smart enough to be a marine biologist. I mean, really, I'm not. As soon as we got into chemistry, I was totally lost, totally lost. So, you know, I think it worked out best <laughs> in the long run. But yeah, but, but you don't know, because I, I think also as a coach, you, you kind of bring up the best of the people around you. And so um, I think there is a tendency that we think that to be good in whatever thing we need to be the experts but i think we both are in a world where or at least i think i don't longer have to be the best to bring out the best for a team uh, oh for, well, for certain be i could definitely bring out the best of a group of marine biologists with no problem i don't have to know anything about what they know exactly <laughs> yeah and that, that's the kind of thing so we, you might end up doing that anyway that would be fun. Uh, you know, so that that might be a nice thing. So if anybody hears it, listens to it, and isn't by marine biology, he can contact you and then see how you That's can help right. them. That's right. That's right. Might I'd be, be a good to thing with, too. Be happy to work with marine biologists. <laughs> that that might be an interesting one. Okay, let's go to the next question. Is that what do you consider your biggest challenge, and why is it a good thing, or at least the biggest challenge that you want to share? Because there might be other things that you don't want to share, but uh, things that you want to share. Yeah, no worries. I'll I'll be in charge of disclosure. I can all, yeah. I about to... I, I I won't say anything. I really don't want to say. Um, you know, the biggest challenge is still going on. It's amazing how long this challenge is taking to dissipate and maybe it will be a lifelong endeavor and basically it is the challenge of taking charge mm -hmm. and um there you know i wrote about it in the coaching agile team's book more than a decade ago and i've 
been working with my command and control monster, you know, since then. Um, and, you know, yeah, probably around since then. So about, what, 12 or 15 years now, that's been a theme in my life. And by and large, that need to be in control or that perceived need, I'll say, to be in control, um, to take charge, to be the one that just moves into action immediately. You know, that has dissipated mostly in my work life, but where it shows up is in my home life. And so I'm really working on paying attention to when I just step out and assume that I'm the one that's going to decide, you know, where we go when we cross the street. Like just, okay, the simplest example, I'm walking through an airport with my 24 year old daughter who is supremely capable of navigating an airport, right? Like the At that age, no I assume no problem. no problem with that whatsoever, right? She can navigate the airport in the world, in fact. Yet I caught myself being the one to just, you know, oh, B41, there's our gate. We have to go that way. Like being the one leading, like, where are we? Like physically, where are we going? And it was such an interesting physical metaphor for what I've been working with for so long which is just this tendency to take charge. Now, I won't say tendency to lead because I don't think that's the kind of successful leadership we need or leadership mm -hmm. for success that we need in the future and now. But it's an ingrained habit. And I said to her, I said, I can't believe I'm doing that. I'm just, I'm just going to step back. You can totally navigate. Mm -hmm. She's like, yeah, I'll do it. I was just having fun, you know, being along for the ride. If I don't have to think about, you know, where we're going, I can just pay attention to what shops we're passing. And I thought, you know okay. what? I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, we so, so, so we swapped. Okay, that's interesting. You probably just didn't pick up her hand just to drag her to the right direction. At 24 years, you don't need to do no, that. But definitely not. It's, uh, but I like the metaphor because indeed, sometimes it's um, we, we just have that tendency. We do that and we think that's the best. And like you say, you might miss out on all the fun that she was yeah, having. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And I'm not even sure that I think it's the best. It's just a very ingrained habit. And so I'm constantly, I'm over time, peeling back the layers of this habit and the places that it shows up. And I, I like that you share it because, well, you've been always very open sharing it in your book. But I like also that you keep telling, like, yes, it's a monster that stays with me even after 10, 15 years. It's, um, and, and, it, I think this is also where you lead an example for the community to show like, yes, it's not because I, I know where it is, I know what it is, that it, it's gone, that monster stays with me and uh, and we recognize it. And sometimes it's good to have it, I can imagine. Like you said, your daughter, like she said, it, there was advantages for her yeah. as well. And if um, there's a fire in the building, I'm the person you want to jump into action. There's no doubt about it. But there are very but, rarely situations that are actually that. Literally yeah, literally. that's 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 the thing, uh, and but it, I, I like that you bring it up because indeed, when there is a fire, you don't want us to sit down in in a circle and say, "Let's decide what direction." No, you want someone who says, "I know what's the right direction. Let's go there," but on the rare occasions, and mm. it's good to practice for these rare occasions, but they happen very rarely. Uh, that's that's the thing, and somehow we're wired in our brain. To, to to always do that because of course that's how we survived as human beings uh because that kind of situations dangerous situations happened much that's more right. million million years ago yeah but not so much in airplane uh, airports uh as that's what you need to do <laughs> right. Right. it's 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 it, yeah but thank you it's it's i think it's a very nice example what uh, tells a lot of things um but we there is still is that that second part uh, of the question why is it a good thing for you um the challenge i want to challenge a good thing for me um well because i think it's emblematic of what we're all going through in this era era mm -hmm. of uncertainty of constant change, of change, in fact, being exponential. Like we used to have these moments where there was a lot of change, but then there would be sort of like a, a calm period and then more change. And and that's not what's happening anymore. It's, you know, all the futurists that I watch and pay attention to tell us it's not going to happen anymore. And so I think that um, this just this notion of being able to take something that's so ingrained inside of oneself and to sort of pull it out and look at it as an object and say, what's good about this? What's not good about this? What piece do I still want? What piece am I willing to let go? 
is a, is a super skill for the world mm-hmm. we're in now and the world we're likely to continue to be in. And so I think that just the, the example of me doing that with that particular thing, with this, you know, limiting belief that, you know, somehow when I take charge, things are better. Um, that I think that's just a good example. So I think it's a, it creates a bit of a pathway for me to work with other people with their limiting beliefs, which might be different, which often are different than mine. Mm-hmm. I like that. And I, I guess also it creates kind of connection with your daughter, for example, if you show, okay, this is my monster and I'm charging it and she probably has hers that are different or similar, doesn't matter, but you show it also. That's a nice mm-hmm. example also from uh, probably how you work with people in a sense. That's a, it's a nice uh, way of sharing it. Thank you. Hmm. So the, the next question I want to go, and I think if some of these things kind of show that you can be a very driven person, but do you know what drives you? Do you have any yeah, I insight do. that you I want do. to share? Um, it's not necessarily anything sexy or you know newsworthy what drives me, but what drives me is people's pain and a lost potential. That's what drives me. And, and- in the sense that uh, you want to fix it or want to help it? In the yeah. sense that when I see it, I think, what a waste of a precious human life. You know, why are we living this way? Why are people allowing their gifts to go unexpressed? And so it drives me to look for what are the reasons why that's happening? And what is maybe my small part in helping people express their gifts, live into their potential, and um, and choose to not accept pain. Hmm. So, so, yeah, okay, and well, maybe not fixing it, but at least showing them the mirror and then seeing what they can do with it, in a sense. Yeah, I mean, um, this is, like, in a nutshell, this is why I started focusing on Agile coaching, because I thought, well, if we equip Agile coaches as change agents, then they'll be able to help teams and organizations alleviate a lot of the pain that people are in in their work lives. And, you know, probably most people would say, I'm not in pain, but you ask about two or three questions of most people, and then they realize how much pain they're actually in. It's, it doesn't take long to scratch the veneer of that, oh, everything's fine, um, until finally they're like, yeah, yeah, why am I living this way? So that, and also bringing in the 10 Women Strong programs into the Agile community. Because there are lots of reasons why, why women, by and large, are not thought of as the thought leaders in equal proportion as men, or even more. This is the project that you're talking about. Oh, this is me. Yeah, this is wonderful that you have this here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ten Women Strong. So this, these are programs that my friend Carolyn Dragon created, um, mm-hmm. and she and I were in a leadership program together, you know, more than a dozen years ago, and um, we brought these programs into the agile world really to help women dismantle the internal um, oppressor that gets put into us that we accept into our lives very naturally. Now, there are lots of reasons. There are lots of external oppression, um, mechanistic mechanics, I guess, that also make it so, you know, women don't flourish as much as we could, even in the agile world. And Organizations like womeninagile.org are working on that. The one that I'm particularly skilled at working with is the internal stuff. And so that's what those programs do. They basically help women find their so purpose. So that's the other one that you're talking about. Uh, the yeah. Women in Agile that's working on the external things. and uh, Yeah, working on the on the um, the more the systemic things in the community. Yes. And what's interesting is that is my yellow arm there. That's my elbow ah. you're looking at, hugging that woman. She was uh, my... Uh, my protege for um, a speaker series where women who want to speak get matched up with an experienced speaker. And then we work together for the few months leading up to her speaking. And then she goes on stage by herself. And she did beautifully. Yeah, it's a nice story. It's a nice story there. Yeah, I, I, I had these pictures prepared because I knew you were involved in these kind of things. I wasn't sure if that we we're going to talk about it or not. Um, but so, but I thought it's it's good because I can also link back to the the URLs later on in, in the comments if people are interested to learn Great. more. Um, 
I, I really, I, I kind of interrupted you when you were talking about the the internal things, the mechanics that that women, I would say, limit themselves is a kind mm -hmm. of way to, to say it. Um, could you share some more about that? Something. Yeah, that... I think so. For, first of all, this is not limited to women. You know, mm -hmm. we all take messages from our environment about how we're supposed to be, what success looks like you know, what a good person looks like, and we internalize them. And even when those conditions in our environment get alleviated, the internal, the internalization of them does not necessarily get alleviated. You know? Yes. And, and so, so we still hear our mother or father or whatever where that message came from. Yeah, exactly. Yes, absolutely. And so it's helping women recognize um, those messages that they have unconsciously downloaded and that govern mm -hmm. what, what their potential is and limit it. And so um, the two women I would say especially women because they get a lot more of these messages than than men. I think it's yeah. fair to say that. Yeah. Well, it's unfair that it happens, but well, it's fair. To... Well, and I think there's plenty of work for men to do too. I really do. I mean, I think there are the, that a parallel program for to ten women strong for men would be a really great idea because there's all kinds of other stuff that they need to dismantle. You know, it's different. It's a different bucket of stuff, but it's no yes. less important, no less difficult than what women have. And um, I'm just geared toward helping women as much as possible, mostly because I have been handed so many teachers and mentors and lucky breaks and in the place at the right time and, and all of that, that I feel like it's my duty to give back as much as I can and to be maybe one of those things for someone else. Yes. So, so yeah, passing on the, the, um, uh, what you, what you learned from the other people that helped you to stand where you are in that sense, mm -hmm. pay it forward. Like they say, okay, thank you very much for, for well, for, for sharing, but also for doing this, because I think, um, it, I've heard already some of the, these people who were in some of these programs and were really happy that they could join that. So. Yeah, we've had over 100 women come through the programs and we took a hiatus in the last couple of years, but are starting now to do some new programs again. Um, I'm going to do a two hour session in about a month called um, Increasing Your Influence and Impact in the Agile World. And I'm going to say about a month. When, when is that more or less? It's going to be on day? April 11th. Okay, April so I have 11th. to make sure that I, I air this video before oh, that. Please. Oh, that would be nice. That would be nice. Yeah, because the more people who can come, the better. We're going to do some really interesting exploration together. And, um, you know, any 10 Women Strong program is prioritizes the feminine essence energy. So it's just so nice to be in an environment where we can allow our, uh, you know, our, our, our holistic thinking, our love of community, our support for one another, our subtlety, our sensuality, where we can allow all of those harmony, you know, all of those essence energies to take front seat. Great. Sounds great. Sounds something like say, I should join, but that's probably not the, the, the goal of this. But yeah, <laughs> it's it's but like you say, we probably need similar kind of uh, things for men as well to to learn to to figure out what are the things that are limiting us? Thank, mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that. So I want to go, because I'm not sure if that's that's part of what you want to share next, but that next question is that, what do you consider your biggest achievement? What do you find something that you're proud of, I would say? Well, I'm not sure about biggest achievement. And the word achievement doesn't even feel right. But the thing that I'm, yeah, thank you for bringing the word proud. A thing that I'm quite proud of is something that I participated in and that has had a huge impact on the world. And I could have never guessed it when I started. And it's being the author of the Coaching Agile Teams book and just the, the incredible impact that book has had in the world. And at the time, my daughter was, um, I think, about 10 years old, mm -hmm. um, a, little, a little older, actually. Now, I'm not good at arithmetic, but just a little bit older. And um, and I said, I'm going to write a book. And she said, okay. I'm like, what do you mean? Okay. She's like, well, okay, you can write a book. Like, it was just no big deal to her. Like the, the idea that I would write a book just seemed in the realm of possibility to her when it didn't to me at the beginning. But then all I needed to do was relax and let the book happen. Mm. And so that's why I, 
you will hardly ever hear me say my book because I just don't have that feeling of ownership that way about it. Of course, of course, I wrote every word in that book, but it was also something that I was participating with, like a force of creativity that I was participating with. And that book just needed to come at that time. And I happened to be the one. And and and, and that links for me back to what you said earlier. I, I would that you were still learning what you wrote in the book in the sense yeah. that it came through you. And you wrote it down, but you might not have completely understood the depthness of what you wrote at that time. Is that correct? Well, that's true. And the underlying disciplines in agile coaching, especially professional coaching, have such a depth to them that I think I could practice that um, discipline my whole life and still not really get the fullness of it. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that's well. We. We've been such a long way since you wrote the book. Uh, I mean, it was not the first book on coaching, on agile coaching, because there was already one or two books out. And I remember seeing your book for the first time, and it was like double or triple the size of other books. And it was like, is there so much? And when I read it, I'm like, yes, there is so much. And now, 10, 15 years later, it's like, yeah, and there is actually a lot more. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, um, so it's interesting, yeah. Yeah, it turned out that we were the harbingers for um, a sea change that's happening in the world, you know, away from a mechanistic thinking and more toward ecosystemic thinking. And and that's not work that's going to be done overnight, and not even in a decade. Maybe it'll take quite a bit longer yet, but that's OK. We are making progress. Yes, and, and yeah, probably, like you say, there's going to be a lot more other people writing the next chapters, books, whatever. Oh, there uh, are. There are. I mean, um, instead of writing a second edition to my book, what I chose to do was record a podcast series with the Women in Agile podcast that Leslie Morse mm -hmm. hosted. Because what I wanted to do was point to all of the advancements in the state of the art of Agile coaching and, and shine the light on those people directly, on those sources directly rather than sort of gather it up in a second edition that would be under my name. That just didn't feel right. So that, so all of that information is out there in the world already. Yeah, I should have prepared that one. I didn't think about that because it's, okay. it's one that but I can't think about everything up front. But indeed, it's, it's one of the nice things that uh, has been coming to our world in, in the recent years as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, it also shows how much different things you have been doing the last years, I think. It's... Um, yeah, I've, I've continued to learn. I take about three or four courses a year. Um, and some of them are very intense. Some of them are multi-year programs. And um, yeah, I've continued to hone myself as the instrument of my craft. And I am really interested in helping people um, just have the impact they want to have in the world and that has taken me to more and more places where i need more and more skills because i keep encountering more and more things with individuals and with um, teams and especially executive teams that i'm just like whoa okay how do we work with this one <laughs> yeah the more we know the more we know that what we don't know and then you want to read more listen more uh build in more it's um yeah, I, I'm always amazed when when I'm in contact with companies and they want. Yeah, how could we, yeah, have a person and and teach them everything you know, but do it in two days and be like, yeah, but this is already twenty years in my making, so and not even halfway through it. So you want that in three days? That's just impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, we we all, I I think, yeah, I I, I spend a large sum of my revenue on on training for myself, and I find this this normal. Uh, yeah. And I think, yeah, all of us do. Um, and, and I'm glad you share it because, um, well, a lot of people might think, oh, Lisa is already there and she's the big expert and you are. But at the same time, you're still on your learning journey and you've always sure. been very open about that. So that's mm -hmm. that is. yeah. OK, I want to go to a, a more practical kind of thing, a question like, do you have a personal agility tip or something that you do that you want to share with the people on, on, yeah, on how you work? Yeah, all right. well, I use the personal agility system to organize my entire work and life and everything that I'm doing. And that's actually, a, a um, I guess maybe I call it a program that Maria Mattarelli and Peter Stevens created. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the thing that I love about that is that 
when you do the you know your personal retrospective um, and planning, that's called celebrate and choose. Mm. <laughs> and I love that name. And so that's like my hot tip for people is to celebrate what you actually do. Because if you're like me, if you're like a lot of people that I meet, you're not giving yourself any credit for so many things that you do that you don't even recognize. And you might get to the end of, I, I run my personal agility um, thing week by week. And so I turn over on a Saturday. Saturday is when I do my mm -hmm. celebrate and choose. And um, you know, by the time I get to the end of the week, if I hadn't really been diligent about recording it, kind of like when I want to lose weight and I have to record every single thing I eat, this is a very similar kind of discipline. Um, but when I am diligent about recording what I do, which is not always what I plan to do, because as we know, stuff yes. happens, stuff happens. Mm -hmm. And I look at it and I say, wow, that was a lot. You know, now I need to rest. And also what's interesting is that the very first thing that's my first priority in what's called a priorities map, basically a storyboard in personal agility, is what I call um, enjoy life. Mm. I have to literally put tasks in my week to enjoy, enjoy life. life. Yeah. That's, and, that's a really good sub tip because indeed yeah. a lot of us, we, we don't do that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, and sometimes yeah, I didn't it, value it, but when I, but when I put it in there, you know, right up next to do X, Y, or Z in the business, you know, or do X, Y, and Z for a client when it's up there and it's, you know, equal to those things, I value it more. I, I like that because it, it reminds me of something I, I read years and years ago is that um, actually before I even had a relationship or there was a book on relations that said, and sometimes when you're in the middle of life, you might even have to plan uh, dates with your partner. You might even have to plan uh, sex with your partner and things like that. And for me, at, at first it felt like, what, how do you do? But if you don't, Sometimes you need, if in the middle of the rush, if you don't plan these kind of things, it might feel like it's not yeah. happening. And then all of a sudden, we, we don't enjoy life anymore because mm -hmm. so many other things um, take priority where that maybe is not that much valuable, but they're they're urgent, that the mm -hmm. urgency takes over. Yeah. And I, I like that you, yeah, it's it's, it's about all kinds of values. I, I like that you, you put it that way. That, that's mm -hmm. really good. And that the, the part where you started with the fact that you um, you say we write down everything or I write down everything I do. I remember indeed that all, most people, and I do it myself, we look at all the things that we haven't done last week and we feel bad. But we forget that we maybe did triple the work of unplanned work and we never look at that. That's and right. we only, or I only feel bad about all that whole to-do list that still is there. But wait a minute, I might have done maybe more urgent and more important things and yeah if i if i don't write it down i kind of forget it yeah and then i i tap on myself for for not doing that yeah i mean there's so, a bully that lives inside of all of us and sometimes exactly. that bully can be really mean yeah and especially if we're driven like you say you want to do your your plan driven you want to do all that stuff and 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 life takes over and we might have still have done a lot more but we feel bad about it so that's yeah. a really good tip it's it's uh, writing down and well i i read i don't know where i read it but somehow i read it that, that sometimes you need just to write down things that you can tick off that box to feel good about hey i done it yeah uh and we usually only tick off the things that we've uh, that we actually planned so that's uh, a good thing and uh, that's a, a really good tip I, I think that will help a lot of people and oh, uh, i'm glad to hear it, it helps well me. i hope it's well well i i, I there is part of it that I don't, but I didn't do it recently, so I'm definitely going mm -hmm. to try it out again. And uh, well, this is a YouTube, so if people like it, you can put it in the comments if you like it or if you stop doing it. That uh, might be interesting to learn from each other. Let's go to uh, the the whole new world. We worked a lot more remote. So, what have you learned about remote work? It could have been recently, but maybe you've done remote work longer than than just the pandemic. Is there anything? you want to share there? Yeah, I've, I've been doing remote work for as long as I've been an Agilist, so about a dozen years now. And when we had Agile Coaching Institute, we conducted transformational education remotely. You know, so it's, mm. we knew it was possible for the pandemic. It's just that 
with the pandemic, we all got a steady diet of it. <laughs> we maybe ate a little too much remote work. It's like pretty exhausting, you know. Um, I can tell you that my eyes are definitely suffering from the amount of time I spend on screens. And maybe a lot of people's oh. are, you know. So, I mean, just there, there's a physical toll to it as well. But, you know, in general, remote work works. And I'm really sitting with the question of when, when is it worth all the different sacrifices to bring people in person. And I like the fact that mm. we're now thinking about, I'm thinking about them as sacrifices, that people are sacrificing their values because they are putting um, carbon into the air when they're on the airplane. People are sacrificing time with their families. People are sacrificing their health, traveling around and, and not sleeping well or whatever. Like, So what makes, if we're gonna be in person, it better be worth those sacrifices. And so that's what I'm thinking about lately. What are those conditions? And so every time someone asks me to be in person, we have that conversation. So, and, and usually people don't think about it that way because we're just, again, it's one of those habits. We're on autopilot about, you know, traveling around. And I got to tell you, I will never travel around the world in the future as I did prior to the pandemic. That was that was stupid. I would get on a plane like it was a bus, like it was like no big deal. Fling and my body for, all over the world all the time. For just one hour of presentation and then going back, something like that. Yeah. Well, it wasn't actually ever that bad, but it was pretty bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, um, but you know, I mean, now, it, now it's a genuine consideration. And when I opened that question for people who want me to be in person, I say, so let's talk about the sacrifices that we'll all make to be in person. And, and then, then bring that value. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that because indeed, when when I I, I remember discussing this with with a family member that says, okay, if I go and to talk in a conference, I want to stay a few more days to enjoy the, the company, or the the country, and everything. And I'm, and I deliberately took the choice not to do it because the, the I would miss out the country, but the sacrifice for my family was much bigger because I have younger children and and yeah. things like that, and she has. So, it, but it made me realize that okay, there there is some balance, and in some countries, I really like when I went to to Israel. It's like okay, this is a one time opportunity that I probably not have much. The option to go so I'll, I'll take some extra time but a lot of other countries i didn't take the time uh and and but like you say you usually don't think enough about that kind of uh work and that's mm -hmm. that is really valuable and well we talked before about it one of the reasons for me to doing these interviews is that i can stay at home and i can uh, have contact with a lot of friends without having to to fly all over and it's a conscious choice to to try to reconnect it to people. And it's not that I don't want to see these people because I miss, well, my American friends in a sense that I haven't seen most of, of the people uh, in, in, in a long time. But yeah, it's, it's like you say, we need to think much clearer about it. So thank you for bringing that up because it's indeed uh, an important thing to for people to do. Yeah, I mean, it's not a question of which one's better or does working remote work. I mean, th those are not even a question for me, you know, because it's always trade-offs, trade-offs. Mm -hmm. and, and really anything we put our minds to can work. Uh, that's 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 really nice to, to say that, that it can work, but it, it might be... Um, I, yeah, I've just uh, today to recording this and um, I just put out the video live with, with Shane Hasty today where he actually says, OK, remote learning, we know that that experience is working. Uh, I'll put the link up here mm. for the people who are interested right. in that video. Uh, but it's um, it's possible, but it's a lot of work and it's other work than when we do in-person training. So we need to think it and it's the um, how how did you put it i don't know the exact word but basically the work is on the on the trainer much more than than on on the students which is normal um it, it feels a lot like if you write a book sometimes you read a book and it's it's hard and you have to do all the work and i feel that it's because the author didn't do the work that he needed to do to make it easier like your book I don't know how much time you spend on it, but it's really well written. It's, it's it's interesting. I understand it. And I don't need to do all that hard work that I sometimes need to do with, with some other people. Um, and, and yeah, that's that's the same thing with remote a, work. Yeah, thank you. Let me just like 
take a moment with that because especially as someone who has um, English as a second, third or fourth language, you know, mm -hmm. that, like to hear you say that really heartens me. Um, and um, wow, that's really great to know. Really well, it's it, it's good that you mentioned it because indeed, as a, as a person whose whose English is third language, for me, um, there is a lot of words in the agile community that are used that I, I it takes me sometimes years to understand. Just um, oh, um, yeah, of course now I cannot come up with these names, but these not. words. But, yeah, um, but but some of the concepts that are really used a lot in agile, it it sometimes takes me years to really grasp the depth. Because of yeah. the English language, mm -hmm. and and I noticed that with Americans and with English people, you all know the subtleties of some of these words that I don't understand. And when you then have an author that makes use the the simple words so that I can understand it, and not use the the largon or the the complicated words that um, that yeah you you for me that that is important it makes your book much more accessible for indeed people who don't have english as a as a, oh that's as, so as good to know language. well you have my husband to thank for that he was the proofreader of that book and he proofread every piece of that book about three different times and he helped me make it much much better it is way less complicated than it would have been without him for sure well, we, we all need people that that happens and need to to tell us like maybe this is a little bit uh, you you and and sometimes um ex well I've had the conversation today or recently with with someone says okay but these these complicated words can help if you talk about experts because then you don't have to explain the whole context just like patterns if you understand the pattern just talking about it can help but especially for people who are new to fields uh, it, it's good to then explain what that pattern means uh, mm -hmm. so that's that's good and i feel that you do that and that's uh, that's what that is also what's important in remote working to come back to the topic where we were originally talking about um so that that happens yeah yeah in, in remote working i find that things just need to be a lot more explicit yes because you know, we're not in the same heart space we're not actually feeling each other's bodies like we do when we're in the same physical space which gives us so so much information and of course you could still feel that like the energetic field between people mm -hmm. um but um but only if you've really tuned your antenna to be able to pick that up and so what i tell people is like just ask I mean, just to start asking questions like so how is the how's the vibe between us right now as we're doing this work together and and I think this is this is good to to learn as a skill to also use it in a physical environment because sometimes we might miss it. Absolutely. If you you work in multiple cultures around the world, and um, I can imagine that sometimes you think you understand the vibe, but because it's from someone from another culture, mm -hmm. it's it's a completely misunderstanding of of a certain vibe. Yep. Um, yeah, as soon as I feel something that could be a little bit of like. Like I, I think about it like this, like the air between me and someone else just got a little bit murky or a little bit un, unclear, like maybe a little bit, there's a little bit, there's something in the air between us. Um, I'm usually fairly good at noticing when that happens. And my question to the other person is, hang on, what just happened? Mm -hmm. um, and usually most people haven't, you know, don't know their minds well enough in that moment to be able to have that right at the top of their mind. But if I just allow them some time to think about it, and they might go like, what do you mean? I said, well, I just noticed something shifted between us, and I don't know what it is. I just want to check in on it. And then they'll go, oh, yeah, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize it. But, you know, like that, that word you use, like we have a different meaning for that word. And it just, it, it felt, it, just, it stung a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. And how great to get that uh, misunderstanding in the making cleared up right away. Yeah. And that that breaks us. You you slow down the conversation at that time, but it actually speeds up the whole process. Absolutely, absolutely. Because now there's not a misunderstanding buildup. Now there's not the potential loss of connection or trust that was being built. Yeah, I mean, you can lose all of those things and never know it. Yeah, and I, I think that's um, what I feel that when we work remote, if you have that skill, then remote feels kind of the same. But mm -hmm. uh, and um, but actually, 
um, I think with a lot of people when they work physically, if they don't have that skill, it it things will drag on or they will they will not notice mm, it. Mm. But uh, they will still think that they're connected, and in the end, it will work out. But it will take longer. Uh, and I think that's that's actually a very good thing to do because yeah, I, I I don't remember where the book and it's also not important, but I've read it somewhere that that says indeed that there is actually a lot of misunderstanding that people think that they're connected and that they don't have the skills like you have to to realize when that connection is gone and and then misinterpret oh but i can read body language yeah but maybe you might that might not be as good your radar might yeah. not be as good as you think it is yeah so we uh, we vastly misinterpret body language yeah i i, I agree with time. that and but you have the, the i like the way you phrase it the fact that i should say okay wait a minute what happened is uh, it, it's a good way because a lot of people then think, oh, wow, well, she, she's really connected and she understands me really well. We're actually, you, what you, literally what you said is we're not connected and I want to check in again. And somehow that, that makes people feel like you understand them very well, where you understand the situation really well, I think, which helps you to, to make you understand it. So that's a really good tip to, to work remotely and not remotely so thank you for sharing this yeah um, you and i can for the people that I, I i don't remember when but i seen you doing this in action uh somehow some, some time ago i don't know if it was exact words but i remember a workshop that i saw you doing something and i recognize telling to the person who was sitting next to me like wow i want to learn this trick so i'm glad <laughs> that you that you brought it up again so i can remember and hopefully well, i won't good. forget it that's so good. good. Okay, I want to go to uh, to talk to a book. Uh, I said last, but whatever book you want to bring up that you think is interesting to to bring up. Um, since I was about ten years old, I've never been without a book. I am constantly mm -hmm. reading at least one book. I'm constantly reading one fiction book. Always, there's a mm -hmm. fiction book, and there's probably a handful of nonfiction books that I'm sort of slowly making my way through little by little. I could pick up a few minutes here and a few minutes there. Um, but the last one that I read that I loved so much is the latest one from Diana Gabaldon, who's the author of the Outlander series. Yeah, there it is. Go tell the bees that I am gone. I'm just such an amazing, epic adventure, you know, in these ginormous books that she wrote. I think there's like 12 of them now or something like that. But um, I would tell you it's worth going all the way back to the first one and just starting. And um, there's a on the Stars Network, there is a, a TV series now also called Outlander that does a very, very amazing job with these books. Okay. I, I'm not sure if we can, if we can, well, depending on where people yeah, are. Yeah, depending on where you are in the world, you may or exactly. may not be able to get it. But you can but check you it can out. read the books. Yep. Exactly. Yep. 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 Yeah, and so, so good. What do you want people to know about this book? Or what do you want to share about that? Without giving away the whole well, story. Well, you know, it. like, uh, I am really into these epic love stories that are like across, and this, this one is like across centuries because these people can time travel. Oh. Okay. It's amazing. It's amazing. And so they go back and forth in time and all kinds of things happen. And, um, and I, it helps me understand the historical periods that they're in. I'm really, I love historical fiction because I love to learn about what, you know, what was life like at a, at a different time in history. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you're in for like an epic adventure, it's a good so one. So that's not, not, not just one book, but it's already, oh, well, it's books. It's many books. <laughs> But it's, uh, I like it because I, I've noticed that uh, sometimes people think when I ask this question, this should be business books or something about Agile. And actually for me, it's like, it can be multiple different kind of books and it's just a way to discover books. And that's that's mm -hmm. what I like when you, when you bring in a book like that. Okay, I want to go to, for me, the most interesting question is that, uh, what question do you think I should ask and, and what's the answer? I have not thought about this yet. So let me just take a moment. I think you should ask me what I see for the future of Agilus. Mm. That's, 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 I, I would really love to hear that answer. 
<laughs> well, it, you know, recently I I um I took again the Strengths Finder assessment, the um, Gallup Strengths Finder thing tells you your top five strengths. And my top strength is connectedness. And my second top strength is futuristic. And that makes a lot of sense to me because I spend most of my time thinking about human beings, our human condition, and where are we headed. And I think a lot about Agilus because I love our community so much. Our worldwide community is incredibly varied and interesting and connected and generous, really generous with one another, you know, learners together, willing to give much of what we've learned to each other for free, you know, and just, it's very virtuous that way. Um, and, and as I think about the future for Agilus, I think about the question of, you know, what is it that we know how to do and how is it that we know how to be that could be useful for people who are working on our planetary level issues? you know, our, our big challenges, yeah. you know, and uh, what could we add that would accelerate their efforts? You know, we have several huge intersecting challenges that yeah. no, no uh, country boundary. They are worldwide and, um, and we're worldwide too. And I'm just well, really the pandemic showed do. this very clearly that we're worldwide and that problems can spread very quickly. That's right. Uh, That's right. It, uh, yeah, definitely. And I remember that in in I think it was in Iceland, part of when the banking crisis happened. Mm -hmm. That because it's a small country, uh, I know that Agilist helped out with facilitating. I think with innovation games, but I'm not sure anymore. Oh, that's how. amazing! It, it it helped there to to some of the, these things. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, so we can definitely help in, in some of these things. And um, even in Belgium, we did um, a version of budget games that with, that Luke Holman created. Uh, I, I can't come up with the, the city. Was it Houston or somewhere else where they they did something similar and that was mm -hmm. inspired in Belgium? We did a few sessions, uh, we think. So that's, and yeah. we can bring it at small or at, at larger level. I think Absolutely. that's- uh, and we're so powerful together, you know, this this trans local community that we already have. I mean, you couldn't want for a greater force on the planet of the earth because on this on the planet of the earth, that's interesting. <laughs> Whatever. You couldn't want for a greater force on the planet because, you know, we're already everywhere. You know? Yeah, I, we're I've, already connected. I've been, I've been on a part of a few mailing lists where from multiple things, people around the world are discussing what's happening. Well, we're recording. We're still ha are in the the war between Ukraine and Russia, and uh, and people from multiple countries jumping in. People from Russia, people from Ukraine, sharing similar uh, feelings, and yeah. So that it's interesting to see them and and looking at it, trying to look, and it's hard because it's yes, people's lives are at stake. Uh, but trying to talk from a systemic level, how can we try to find a uh, solution and, and how can we help out? And sometimes it's pure practical, indeed, helping yeah. people survive. But sometimes it's, uh, well, I think we, I, I was at least in, in Kiev and at Ajali. I think you were there at, mm -hmm. at some point in time as well. We have lots of friends there and have been yeah. in contact with, with some of them who yeah, have been fleeing or trying to find and and uh, I heard about friends who have discussions between um, well in their partnership because when I'm discussing with my partner it's about whatever local problem but they're discussing like should we well one partner wants to flee and another one wants to uh, defend their country and okay that's the kind of difficulty in a partnership to discuss like that's that's heartbreaking mm -hmm. um, when you hear this and so indeed I hope we with whatever we're doing we we might help out to to uh well solve or help prevent next kind of conflicts like this like you're saying because we we bring a lot of things looking at it from a systemic point of view eh? we do. Uh, and and that's that's what is indeed uh, could help out so that's um uh, it's it's a wonderful thing that you bring it up because um well with agile 
we, we just celebrated last year the 20 years anniversary and some people then said well it's it's about time it's dying and it's over and and i hear people like you were saying also well well maybe some parts are dying but at least we have so much to bring to the rest of the world where we can still continue like what you said earlier about your book and about all the other people who are building on it so that's definitely not something that is dying it's only growing i would say Mm -hmm. uh, so there is still a lot that we we can bring there so it's yeah. um it's wonderful to think to make you and to make all of us think about that yeah so um and uh, yeah so if people like that they can also i, I keep forgetting it. people tell me you have to tell people that they can sell something in the comments or whatever so if people feel inspired at it bring it on and, and see if we can oh. Yeah, if we can inspire each other, I think. Yeah, that. yeah, I'd like I'd like the sparks of this conversation to fly all over the world. I'd like us to really be seriously in this conversation in our community. Yeah, I think but it, it's the world needs it. Let's put it that way because it's definitely we're so connected that we can no longer think about issues uh, on on a local scale. I think we need to think at uh, on a global scale and look at all these things so um then i want to go to the, the the last question is that um who should i in, invite next who do you think i should uh, yeah in, yeah there invite. are a lot of people that came to mind but the one that i want to put forward is joanne stone so joanne is an agile coach oh look there that's she is joanne stone that's so great so she's an agile coach um she's in canada and she is hosting a series of um, conversations and she's pulling together a community really around what we were just talking about. Hers is called um, mm -hmm. Wick Wicked and Agile. It's like, what is the intersection of wicked problems and agility is the, is the, like, the terrain that that group thinks about and talks about. And what's really cool is that she is interviewing people outside the Agile world, people who oh. already work in wicked problems, like a 911 operator who works in, um, like when there's a disaster and they pull operators 911 operators 911 is like the emergency number in the u.s yeah, yeah. And they pull these operators i know maybe together. not everybody else knows it indeed. yeah 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 yeah. so so like she's interviewed her and she's interviewed people who are working in healthcare crisis and other things like that to just find out how how are you already working with your wicked problem so that we can now mm -hmm. consider as agile as like what do we have to offer you know, like let's not presume that we that we have, that we have a offer, solution. But but like you know, let's investigate it. Let's you know, let's let the empirical process work here, and let's do it with a lot of joy in our hearts because you know who knows what we can discover. And and learn from from well, uh, yeah. and imagine people who are doing disaster recovery or whatever disaster helping out. They have lots of skills that they can bring us as well. Absolutely. I I yeah. think that's uh, and uh, yeah. For me, agile is is a world where we actually we have always been good at capturing what's happening around us and learning from it, and and we should keep doing this. Um, yeah. yeah. Sometimes we we try to sell it as we invented it, and then I, I don't like that part. We we should be much more telling about what are our sources and where we're learning it. But we're really good at at seeing what what's happening. We are. Um, and I, I like indeed when I looked on 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 her website the, the the words she's using the wicked kind of thing. It's um, I like it because it's indeed I think well even me as a non-native speaker I immediately have some kind of image of what that kind of thing is. So that's uh, that is that is like that is uh, very much. So thank yeah. you very much for for Welcome. this uh, interview for this hour. We're about uh, one hour that we're talking. If people want to get in touch with you, what is a good way to get in touch with you? Probably the easiest one-stop shop is my website. So it's lisaadkins.com, but you have to know about the spelling. There it is on the screen, L-Y-S-S-A-A-D-K-I-N-S.com. Yes, uh, yeah. People, you have one of these names that there's multiple ways of, of typing in it, uh, first name. I do. Uh, so I can imagine a lot of people. And I remember when I actually was typing it in earlier today, I uh, I mistyped. I, I just typed one A, so I definitely had to, to do it, even if I know there is an A. In well, the first it just looks wrong. Name. It looks wrong because there's exactly. two S's and two A's, and you think, that doesn't uh -huh. feel right. But yeah, it, it is so. 
<laughs> yeah, well, it's um, it, there is only your parents to blame for that name, that full name, or and your my husband. Grandpa. I took, I took yeah. my husband's name when we got I, here, so there you go. The two, so all three of those people, all totally three of these. People. <laughs> well, it's uh, but yeah, it's to blame and to to thank for. I would say. Oh, you know what? I tell my parents. Um, gosh, you could not have done better for search engine optimization if you had tried. <laughs> I am very happy with my strange name. <laughs> It's uh, yeah, that's that's I, I think uh, Kevin Henney talks a lot about that as well. That he says I have a very unique name and that that helps a lot. Um, I actually don't because I have a nephew that has exact same name as I have, and I have indeed also my parents to blame because mm -hmm. that person existed before I was born, so they took a name that existed already. And because we share the same grandfather, I even the second name is the same as well which I oh, discovered wow. when I worked at, I actually made a mistake to once work at the company where he was already working for 20 years. So uh, a lot of mix up and emails and, and thing happened at that time. Uh, but it gives us great conversations as well. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's interesting. Okay, well, thank you for your time. Uh, I hope that the people who listened in enjoyed this as much as I did. And uh, like you said, uh, earlier on i hope the next time we can meet somewhere in person again and until then we'll, uh, yeah this was this was, a, this was a nice little chat off to the side in our own private conference this was great <laughs> thank you exactly. for inviting me <laughs> thank you very much bye 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 thank you for watching who's agile where the stories of agilists come to life i hope you liked today's interview subscribe if you're not subscribed and want to get to know other agilists